Uh, as uh, this is a very exciting morning for us at Milano, for the folks at the Studley Graduate Program in International Affairs, and for the New School as a whole. Um, it's exciting in part because it's a bit of a week for um, our esteemed colleague, Lily Ling, who last Friday, in a room adjacent to this room, some of you were present there on the panel, um, did a, um, a launch of her book, The Tao of World Politics. So if you haven't seen the flyer out in the front, I suggest you take a look at it. And some of the discussants from that session on Friday are here with us today. Um, I think Lily's work is exemplary of what this conference today is aiming to accomplish, which is to reframe and reshape the ways in which we think about international relations as a field, and to bring in uh, so-called alternative voices um, from the West, although I, uh, I think that the mistake, of course, is that these voices were never part of the founding of international relations theory as a whole. Um, most of you probably know that the New School has a rather, as they say around here, legendary progressive history. Uh, and what that means is that in 1919, which was nearly 100 years ago, the New School was founded by a small group of scholars who left Columbia University in part because they were in opposition to signing um, an agreement uh, during the um, World War I period time and wanted to be in a place where there could be free expression and activist scholarship and open dialogue about the controversial issues of the day. Um, a large part of the new school is also the Parsons School for Design, uh, founded in 1896, that also has its own progressive history about uh, the ability for artists to be able to have individualistics and free expression of um, artistic endeavors. And so those two arms of the new school come together in our current um, configuration as what the, the vision of the new school is now currently being articulated, which is the intersection between design and social research, bringing together those ideas to be able to engage in the most pressing topics that the world is facing today. And I think this, um, this conference today is really right at the center of those debates, which is to say, how could we reshape the way we think about um, teaching of international relations? Who can create a group to actually stand outside the mainstream and build a power and energy to bring those ideas along? And that group are the authors of these chapters and the people in this room. And then how do we actually reconfigure an, uh, the next step of dialogue around these issues. So I thank Lily for organizing, and I welcome all of you today to what is going to be a very exciting undertaking. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Cohen, director of the Julian J. Studley Graduate Program in International Affairs in the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban, Study, uh, Urban Policy. In the new school. In the new school. <laughs> Mike. Thanks, Lily. Uh, let me just uh, add to Mary's welcome um, a, couple, a couple of remarks. I'm particularly happy to, that we can have this, this event and the, the focus of the, the questions that are going to be posed. Um, I've been here, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And one of the things that I noticed in the beginning about the New School was that it, it tried to create spaces and opportunities to bring voices from the South into the into into New York and to have conversations uh, about dominant ways of thinking or Western ways of thinking, and sometimes it works, some not always. Uh, but I think it's very important uh, for for the faculty and the students to hear a range of voices and perspectives on sometimes the, on the same problems. I don't think this. Um, I think that. That quest is complicated by at least two or three significant problems. The first problem, I would argue, is when we say that an idea or a perspective comes from someplace else, that presumes that we can begin to understand the context of that someplace else. And I'm very uh, continually I'm humbled day by day, more each day, by the, uh, the, the humility that we have to have vis-a-vis -vis understanding what, what local context actually is. You know, um, in the United States, there's this phrase, uh, I guess it comes from, from the military, about ready, aim, fire, right? And I think that what happens too frequently, both in the inter at the international agencies, but also in academia and in the press here, 
It's ready, fire, aim, all right? Where we don't really understand what's going on in the context. It's not surprising that we miss w with our observations and, and our interventions, whatever they are, they're inappropriate because we don't really understand the context. We don't understand the values that drive it. We don't understand the institutional frameworks. And the notion that a static snapshot represents what's going on, whether whether it's in South Africa or Morocco or in Colombia, these are it's daily moving all the time. So why should we assume that we have the analytic instruments that can be as precise and as sensitive to local context? So the first thing is, I think the whole question of context is, is should be much more contested. And the thing that I like to think about here in our graduate program is that we're trying to get our students, as well as ourselves, more conscious about what we mean by context. The second question is, let's assume we did get the context a little bit more accurate than, than before, and we understand it a little bit more clearly. Um, what's the relationship of one context to another, or, or that context to, a, to broader frameworks? And I think that's e it's another kind of epistemological and theoretical problem. You know, and what's understood is thing in one place is really not understood in the other. And so the notion of constructing theory and constructing relationships uh, without kind of a myriad set of visions and pluralities, and it's, or as Lily says, multiple worlds, right, I think we're in real trouble. So to, to presume, it's one thing to understand context, but then if you presume unity and consistency of the whole, you miss it again, because what's the, what's the link and what's the connection? So I think the relational issues are also to be contested and need to be understood and articulated, and in fact tested to understand, to be hi hypothesized and theorized and to try to understand it. But the part of it that bothers me even more than the first two are what's the nature of, of positive response, understanding, and action in these contexts. I mean, if we believe in some sense of, of global responsibility, not just, for, I don't mean from the United States, but I mean as individuals, wherever we are, what does it mean to be helpful? What does it mean to, to be understanding? Uh, or, is that, or is this really completely ridiculous? Right? Is it completely ridiculous that anybody in North America could actually think they could be constructive and helpful in Colombia or South Africa? Well, I, I would, being an optimist, I would say, no, I don't think it's ridiculous, but it certainly is questionable, all right, given, given the historical record of what's going on, or the French in Morocco, or, or what, does it, what does it mean to be helpful? And, and here, I think, um, uh, we, we talk here a lot about theory and practice, and about what, whether we can get students understanding the theory, even if we get the theory right, and I think as, as this conference suggests, there are multiple visions of what the theory ought to be. But then the question of how do you turn that into practice, and what does it mean to do a good job? What does it mean to be to listen? Um, I recently had a, a conversation here with with a couple of our graduates. I said, "So what happened? Uh, you know, what's happened in the last three or four years to you professionally?" And most of them. Most of the better ones come back and say, actually, I just learned to listen. You know, that's a, if they learn to listen, <laughs> then we say, well, it's good. But it's, it's good, but it's not that good, right? We'd like them to do more. We're more ambitious than just listening. We don't want people just to be passive listeners. We want them to be active participants and responsible citizens. So what does that mean? Right? So we've really got an enormous set of, 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 uh, of connections here, of steps in the process which are, are, I would argue, are contested and, and complicated. And for, this, for the school and the university, I mean, the, unlike most universities, this place, and I'm saying this mostly to our, to our guests, this university actually presumes right, that you could figure out those relationships, you could identify those concepts, and you could do a better job, and that you send out students to do a better job in the world and to be better people. And uh, I, I'm constantly, you know, kind of flummoxed or, or astounded by the, the arrogancy even of that assertion. So, so here we are. Um, we're trying to make sense of part of the process. And I'm, I, I'm always, uh, I think, in, over many years in conversations with Lily, 
I share her her perception, your perception of, of uh, we really got to do a better job on the first or beginning steps of how we perceive the situation, how we understand it before we can presume to be active in this area. So I'd just like to welcome everybody and these sort of cautionary notes and my own worries over the weekend, but worries all the time about what are we actually doing here in our own processes. I don't think it's so, nothing, none of these things can be taken for granted as you all know very well. Um, so with the a, with a best, best of intention, welcome and I look forward to, uh, to today's event. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Mary and Mike, for your opening remarks and for your uh, great uh, wishes for our conference. I learned this morning that Columbus Day is a federal holiday, uh, even though our university doesn't have a holiday. But then I thought, what day isn't a holiday for the US government these days? <laughs> So uh, that may account for uh, a little bit of the lack of um, uh, participation at this conference. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Studley Fund of uh, SGPIA and the India China Institute for making this conference possible. Um, but in particular to that, I would like to say that no conference can take place without the people who work tirelessly behind the scenes. Foremost among these is my chief assistant, Laurent Nico, who has been working <laughs> since last summer uh, on this conference, and even until tomorrow when the conference formally ends. And also, I'd like to thank our two uh, student volunteers, uh, Sammy Clements from uh, GPIA, and also Nicolas Rodriguez, who is also from GPIA. Uh, they deserve a round of thanks for their time, labor, and most importantly, enthusiasm for this conference. So thank you. I'd like to thank our discussants also. Uh, some are colleagues, other are students, uh, particularly students from my class, Non-Western Approaches to the World. One student emailed me last night saying that in reading my paper, he's serving as discussant for my paper. He said, in reading my paper, it was doing violence to his stomach. <laughs> I took it not to mean the content of the paper, but rather that he was nervous about being a discussant. So we are especially uh, thankful, grateful, and um, supportive of our student discussants. This is uh, for many of them, perhaps for all of them, the first time they are uh, acting in this formal capacity. Um, lastly, uh, I thank you, members of our audience, for being here with us today, particularly since it's a federal holiday. Now, let me give you a little bit of a brief background to this conference and our project. Over the years, like-minded colleagues have met at the annual meetings of the International Studies Association to discuss the idea of a textbook on international relations that voices the global south. Many of us have critiqued the hegemony of the West in the study and conduct of world politics since the field's beginnings in the imperialist politics of the 19th and 20th centuries. Now it's time we offer a concrete alternative, and that's what our project is. Our project aims to produce a textbook for international relations that voices the perspective of the global South. Um, towards this end, some of us met for the first time at um, Professor Masaris University. If I mispronounce it, please forgive me. Al Ahwan University, is that close? In Ifran, Morocco. At this time last year, so it's been one year since our first gathering and our first ideas and formulations of this project and how we will write for this project. And uh, so today's conference is an attempt to continue those early efforts. And we look forward to receiving critical feedback from our discussants as well as from one another on how we are doing and how we will progress towards the next stage. Not all members of our project, unfortunately, are here today. Um, many could not be here for various reasons, but uh, this conference is being videotaped, so I hope that we will be able to give them a sense of what happened today um, through this record. Today's conference is divided into three basic sections. The first section is, what is world politics? And this section 
looks at what is actually happening in world politics. So the, the three papers for this section addresses uh, that question. Uh, the second section it asks the question, what is IR? And the three papers for this section look at how the field of international relations studies uh, world politics. And the last section asks the question, what can the South offer? That is, what new perspectives are on the horizon from a Global South perspective? Again, I thank all of you for being here, and I look forward to a day of stimulating discussions and debates. So let us begin. Thank you. <laughs>